So I found a quote. I found a quote that I liked uh, this, this morning that I thought I'd read. This is by Henry Ford. And Henry Ford said, failure is simply the opportunity to begin again, but this time with more, uh, excuse me, this time more intelligently. I really, I really dig that quote. Um, and I read it specifically before we uh, talked to Nathan because I don't know if anybody was here for the business track last year, right? Uh, this was uh, Nathan's first business track last year, but I gotta tell you, I sat back here and I listened to what this man had to say and I was inspired. Um, I, 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 really, I really enjoyed his interview last year and so I wanted to have him back this year uh, so that he could talk about his failures. Yeah. <laughs> So would you like to start, sir, Nathan? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, it's great to be back, by the way. This is, uh, this is a lot of fun. So we could talk about how for years I neglected my family uh, for business, or we could talk about how I lost a third of my income and in health insurance in one day. Why don't or, we... Oh, go, oh yeah. Well, go, there's, yeah. No, keep or, going. <laughs> or I, uh, the time that I was sued by a major telecommunications firm in federal court. Uh-huh. Or we could talk about um, how I neglected health for years. It's up to you. Oh, let, let's, let's, do, all four. Okay. do all four. Yes, we, sure. got, we got 25 minutes. Let's okay. do all four. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to start with family. I think that's okay. a great one to yeah. talk about. Yeah, sure. let's start with family. Tell me about that. Wow. Okay, so I think, in my opinion, your greatest weakness is your greatest strength taken to an extreme. So, um, you know, I, I'm a helpful person. I love to be helpful. I love to see other people grow, and I love to go all in helping them do that, right? So... The downside of that is, for years, uh, I got, I received affirmation and my, you know, self-worth from being recognized as the hero by clients, right? I don't know if anybody else struggles with that. Um, so that's what I've, I've dubbed the hero syndrome, and I'm working on some content around that. But, uh-huh. uh, you know, we've heard of the imposter syndrome, and this is sort of the, the kissing cousin to imposter syndrome. But, you know, being the hero is addictive, and for years, I would work late, drop everything, anytime a client would call, email, whatever, because I wanted to be the hero. You know, I wanted to be seen that way in the client's eyes. And the, the, for some clients, it's not as bad, but there are other people, other clients who will suck the life out of you if you let them, right? They will take advantage of that and will not think twice about it. And these are people who can never ultimately be pleased. And so for years, I struggled with that. And so, how do you, what's the flip, how, how do you stay the hero, right? Because it is a good spot to be, and it's good for customer service, and it's, it's good all around, but also set, set healthy boundaries. Yeah, well, and that's the key, right, is, first of all, something has to happen deep in your soul to realize that your ultimate worth is not, it does not come really out of, outside of, from other people, anyway. You have to find that place of self-worth in your own self. We talked about some therapy here. Therapy, a good, wise counselor is good for anybody. I don't care who you are or where you are in life. Uh, It's good to have a trained person to just reflect with. Um, But, you know, finding finding self-worth in yourself rather than in your work or in a marriage relationship or friendships, it's got to come from inside. And when you do that, that lets you set healthy boundaries to protect the things that you feel are the most important and not things, not priorities that are set by other people for you. You were seeking some external affirmation. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, 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 and using that for something else besides business. It sure. Was, it was personal, it was, at least you thought, it was personally fulfilling. Mm-hmm. Like, that no, I think close. that's it. Yeah, I think, I think that's it. And I think most people, I don't want to generalize my own weakness, but I think, oh, does that resonate with you guys? Do you, you find the need to have other people affirm you? And it's, it's not that that's necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I think it's healthy to affirm people. Matter of fact, in the, uh, I, I lead a coaching group of freelancers, and one of the, when we have our group call every month, uh, one of the first thing we do is celebrate. You know, tell us something good that sure. happened in the last 30 days. Yeah. Because, you know, when you're in your tribe, there are very few other people who can appreciate the fact that you solved that stupid semicolon out of place problem in the PHP, you know, (laughs) right? So, and it's good to be affirmed, but, you know, if you wake up in the morning having to be affirmed by someone else to feel like you're worthwhile, then it's, it's, it's difficult. But it's different coming from your peers, right? Than coming from somebody that you're, from a client or a customer, right? Correct? Yeah, well, yeah, I think, 
Yeah, in some ways, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, what was the next one on your list? <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Uh, oh, so there was the day that uh, I lost a third of my income and in health insurance in one, yeah, in one day. Okay. So uh, at that time, this was um, 2008. Uh, I was not in the WordPress world yet. I, 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 it was shortly after this I found WordPress. But uh, so I, I've been, I, I started building and selling websites in 1995. I've been at this forever. And one of my big, in, in those days, my model was, you know, I was in the Dreamweaver space, everything, you know, custom oh, build, oh. you know, everything, <laughs> ground up, and, you know, few, a few, a few clients, big retainers. That was the model, right? Mm -hmm. you, a handful of clients, you know, five, six, eight thousand dollar, fifteen hundred dollar retainers per client, right? And it was, it was good money, uh, until it's not good money. Um, so, in two, how many of you remember what was going on in two thousand eight, right? The bottom fell out, right? Yeah. So one of my biggest clients was, ironically, a hair salon in Birmingham, Alabama, where I'm from. Uh, and I you know, had been serving these people for a long time. I was doing everything under the sun for them, print design, graphic design, um, some web, some video, photography, everything basically they needed. I was selling anything I could at that point to you know, make ends meet. And I walked in one day and the economy tanked and uh, they brought me into the office. You know, I thought I was there to just fix a couple of little problems. They brought me into the office and said, I'm sorry, after this month, that's gonna be it. And it was the end of the month. Uh, and so not only were the, did they represent a third of the income that was coming into my business, but they also were providing health insurance for my oh, wow. family. So I walked out of that place that day and you know they were in a, a big mall and so you had to park on the other end of the parking lot if you had working association with a business. And that was the longest walk I ever had in my life. And so I'm, I'm thinking, okay, I've got to call my wife and explain to her that, well, honey, we've just lost a third of our income and health insurance, right? And I had two small kids. Uh, that sucked. But I remember on that, that walk to my car, I can, still, I can still see it in my head right now, I, I realized and I, I told myself, I will never let this happen again. I will never let this happen again. And the, the business takeaway from that is, if you have one client that represents that big of a stake in your business, you are, it's, it's, a, it's a ticking time bomb. Because when that client who consumes a lot of the oxygen in your world drops out, you're in trouble. So I, I began, that was the day where my business model began to change. I was dabbling in WordPress at that time. I started exploring more and I, I pivoted my whole business model away from uh, these large retainers for a few clients into smaller WordPress care plans for lots of different clients. And now, if a client drops, it's okay. We have plenty more. They represent a very small percentage of overall income. Is there a certain percentage that you won't let uh, a client go over? I mean, is there, I know it's kind of feel, but, it, you know, obviously a third's too big. Uh, yes. And, you know, I don't know that I could put a percentage on it. Okay. But, you know, you, you sort of get a gut feeling, okay, this client is really taking a lot of my time in the, in, the, in the pie chart of my world, and I'm starting to rely on them too much, and you know, that's, it, it can be dangerous. And the other thing I'm hearing is it's a third of your income, right? But it wasn't a third of your headspace. That is a great point. Right? Yeah, because not only, you know, when you have a client that is consuming that much oxygen, uh, and they're paying you, you know, that much money, you know, it, at first it looks great, yeah. but the amount of thought time and <laughs> worry time about keeping this client you know, because when that client calls, you're going to stop everything, right? Which feeds into the first thing we talked about. Right. You know, if they called on a Saturday and I'm having fun with my family, I'm going to stop and take that call and go spend an hour working on their problem, which just totally blows the family day. Sure. It's really hard to set up boundaries when you are depending on that, that client for so much. And so the flip side of that is, okay, it's a, it's a third of your income. It's more than a third of your headspace just for your focus. But also, what's that costing you? opportunity cost wise on the on the back side oh, yeah so <laughs> a lot because as a as a, if you're a especially if you how many of you are you freelancers in here like you're the okay awesome you're my tribe so <laughs> <clears throat> when you're the only person or whether you're in a, even in a small team you have to wear all the hats you just have to so you have if you have a client or are you you know one of the most dangerous things a freelancer can do is take on a huge project it is, and that sounds crazy, but if you have a project that's gonna consume your life for six months, it looks great because this big pile of income comes in, 
But guess what? You're probably not going to have the time to do the marketing and networking and whatever. So what happens at the end of that six months is cash flow goes to zero, right? Unless you have a really good, healthy, recurring revenue stream. So it's incredibly dangerous. If you're not wearing all, you're letting one client consume all the headspace and you're not balanced in all the things you have to do in your business, you, you could put yourself out of business. Yeah, that's a great point. Great point. Um, real quick before we go on to the, the third story, <laughs> right? Anybody who did raise their hand as freelancer or anybody in the room, can they relate to what Nathan's saying here? That you've got a client that pays you less than what they're taking in your headspace? Is that, is that familiar? Okay, good. We're making some progress. Yeah. What's next? Oh, well, so this, <laughs> uh, there was the day I was sued by a national telecommunications firm in federal court. Okay. That was a bad day. Uh, it started with a sheriff knocking on my door, serving me some papers. Oh. Uh, this was in the early days of the internet. I think it would have been 1990, it was late 96 or early 97. And uh, I was, uh, uh, our first little web venture, I was living in a small town in Louisiana, and uh, our first big client, right, my first client was the, the parish county, the parish uh, economic development office, and we had a, a little web server, and, you know, uh, and some things got posted on that web server that were defamatory towards a large telecommunication, well, allegedly defamatory, we'll say, right, uh, toward this large telecommunications firm, which you would all, you know, recognize immediately if I told you, and, you know, we thought we dealt with the issue, it was a mistake, uh, you know, we dealt with it the same day, and then, you know, about 10 weeks later, on a Monday morning, 8 o'clock, sheriff's deputy knocks on my door and hands me a, a paper that's a, a lawsuit. And I'm, you know, at that point, I'm like 24 years old. I'm making nothing, Oof. you know, just newly married. I mean, pff, I was petrified, absolutely petrified. And the, 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 you know, it's a, it's a long story, but it, it turns out okay. We, we had a lawyer that got aggravated that we were being picked on. Our attorney's take was they're trying to establish some case law. No internet case law existed at that time. Uh, and so they were trying to get some case law established on an easy case. And he took the case pro bono. We went in and the judge threw it out. It was, you know. Uh, but the takeaway from that is be real careful who your partners are. Because uh, somebody did some things and I became responsible for them. And it turned into about 18 months of pretty much hell. Sure. Uh, worry and anxiety, you know, not being able to have a lot of peace internally about what was going to happen next. Sure. Okay. Number four. Number four. <laughs> uh, the, yeah, so f that's the, the health conversation. Yeah. Right? Let's yeah. talk about that because you've yeah. recently gone through a transformation. Yeah. So uh, when I was here last year, I weighed 270 pounds. I'm five foot six. Uh, and since December the 10th, the day after I came back from WordCamp US, uh, I've lost about 80 pounds. Congratulations. Uh, yeah. And that's... So it's, it's hard when you work behind a desk all day, right? It is hard to focus on health. And uh, this, is, this is, it's just a new priority for me. And uh, what it's turned into is realizing lots of things that I've let slide. Um, you know, the business takeaway from that is, you know, th there are so many little micro habits that you can establish in your world, uh, not only on the health side, but on the business side to increase your productivity, to increase your health, to just do small things. You know, how many of we know we should be drinking more water, right? We hear that all the time, drink more water. You know what, how I drink more water? I have water within arm's reach all day. I mean, mm -hmm. how stupid is that? But if it's there, I'm gonna drink it, right? Uh, it's little things like that, little small things you can do uh, in your life and in your business that if you'll just do this little thing, those micro habits build up to big time avalanche change. Great. So. Um, one thing I'm going to pick out of what one of the yeah. things you said is you mentioned the, the D word, Dreamweaver. Is there, <laughs> is there anybody else in the room that, uh, that, that I recognize from the Dreamweaver support group? <laughs> <laughs> um, you've been building websites for as long as I've been building websites, right? Yeah. I started my company in 1995. You started, you started selling Same websites time, in yeah. 1995, right? Um, and this is a little bit off topic, but how did you make that transition from building everything by hand to this, to, to WordPress, to content oh, wow. management Okay, system? this is such a fun story. Yeah. So uh, I did a, a talk in Jacksonville two years, was it? yeah, it was last year, 
And it was in the, the Gutenberg crisis, right? We all survived that, right? <laughs> the, the sun came up after WordPress 5. It was like, it was like Y2K That's all serious. over again. Gosh, it really was. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I hate WordPress. That's perfect for the video. Uh, can, we, uh, can we get that snippet on Twitter? <laughs> I had a big slide that said, I hate WordPress in this talk. And that's, those words came out of my mouth in 2008. Uh, I hate WordPress. It's going to ruin my business. Okay. Which is ironically what people said about Gutenberg last right. year as well, right? Yeah. Uh, so, and it was, it was in, that, in that phase of my life that I described earlier where every, I was all in on Dreamweaver, all in on, you know, several good clients, big retainers, and here comes this WordPress thing, and it lets people edit their website. They are, you know, they are taking away my ability to sell this thing that I do, right? See if they can and so it required a major pivot, uh, and it took some time for me, and it, that was actually that, that story that I told earlier that was the pivotal change for me of realizing this, you know, this model that I had is not sustainable anyway. People want to be able to edit their websites. Well, some do. How many of you have WordPress clients that never log into their website anyway? Yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> but, you know, th that started the process. What really sold me on WordPress was we were building a site for a client who needed a dealer locator. You know, they had a product that was going to be in dealers. And, you know, I reached out to my developer, and it was going to be about, you know, $1,800, $2,000 to build that by hand. And then I found a WordPress plugin for $39 that did it already. And I thought, there might be something to this. Because <laughs> you know? that's, that's a lot of margin. Yeah. You, can, you can just buy this and install it, and it works, right? So, and then I, I slowly discovered the WordPress community, yep. which is the best part about WordPress. Uh, and realizing not only are there people who have probably already thought about problems that I already have and, and likely already have a solution, but there's this immense community of people who are just amazing. Uh, you know, I've had the privilege to, you know, to be at over 50 WordCamps so far across the United States and Canada, and it's everywhere. Every WordPress community I've ever been in is amazing. Just people who are willing to give, willing to share. I mean, here you are. You're standing up here sharing. With, you know, it's an amazing thing uh, that we, amazing thing we have the privilege of being part of. Cool. All right, we've got questions for Nathan. We covered a lot in a yes, short time, but I guess you covered it all. <laughs> got it. Oh, back there. Hang on, what, one sec. How did you lose the 80 pounds? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, how did I lose the 80 pounds? It, it's, uh, it's a plan I'm on. Uh, that's, uh, it's built, based around eating every two to three hours a small meal and then one meal at night, which I'm happy to talk to you more offline uh, if you want to do that. But, yeah. but like hey. everything else you talked about, it sounds like even your health needed to be a process. That's it. And so uh, I watched a friend of mine who is my health coach uh, drop 200 pounds uh, easy. Uh, well, I say easy, at least 200 pounds uh, and ke kept it off for a few years. And I finally talked to her and I watched some other people she was helping do the same thing. And I'm like, look, is this, is this a plan that's easy enough where I could stick to it and follow it? Because I'm, I'm very much a process person. I have a checklist for, you know, when I go to a WordCamp, I got a checklist in Trello to plan, you know, to, yeah. to you know, make sure I don't forget stuff. Uh, if it's got a checklist and a plan that I can follow, I'm going to do it. I'm going to execute on it. And that's what this was. It was an easy plan, to, you know, to follow that, you know, it's a process. And really, I mean, that's, no matter what you do, if you can figure out how to turn that into a process that you can follow and just be accountable to that process, you're going you're gonna to be better. So a different question. One of the other things I was thinking about as you're telling all these stories, right? One of the, thing, one of the things that, uh, and it's wonderful that you've shared everybody your experiences because they can take away from your experiences, hopefully learn from what you've gone through. But is there a way when you're in the moment, right, uh, especially with your family, right? And, and that resonates with me because I've been through that before as well. Yep. It, it's hard to recognize that you're neglecting something, right? You're neglecting your family when you're in that moment. You can't see it. Right? right? It's almost as if you've got blinders on, right? You can't see it. Is there anything that you've discovered over the years that you can kind of step outside of that moment and say, okay, I need to shift something or do something differently? Is there a process that you've discovered for that? Oh, man. Okay, yeah. So I'll answer that two ways. 
first, it, it, inside yourself, you have to be willing to be wrong. That's a great takeaway. Uh, pride is the enemy, huh. right? I mean, you can learn that from lots of sources, you know, from the Bible to Greek mythology. You know, hubris gets you nowhere, right? Sure. Uh, if you're not willing to be vulnerable and teachable by people, first of all, you're a jerk. <laughs> Second of all, <laughs> you, I mean, you, your success will be limited. You have to be open to be instructed by people. Uh, the second thing is you have to have people in your life who have the privilege of calling you out on stuff. Uh, you have to have relationships. Uh, you know, mine starts with my marriage and then a couple of close friends who have the, the open door to say, you're really missing it right here. Because we can fool ourselves into anything. We can talk ourselves into anything. You can make excuses for anything. Um, <laughs> We can fool ourselves very easily. So you have to have somebody on the outside looking in to say, you're really missing it right here, and, you, and you, need to, you need to change this. But then you have to be humble enough to say, you know what, you're right. Yeah, good, good life lesson. Yes, one more, Jesse. Thank you. Uh, Nathan... One of the things I'm taking away, because I'm more business oriented, I'm really trying to get something started up off the ground. And I'm curious to hear from your point of view, because you've worked with so many other freelancers, agencies, what have you. Uh, have you recognized some top three or maybe five traits that you can tell from an offset is going to make a business very successful? For example, I heard you talk a little bit about adaptability, and we all know that you need that in business. So I'm curious to hear what other traits you think or characteristics are key to, to a successful venture. So what, yeah, what, what traits do you think uh, can predict success? Wow, okay. Does that sum up your question? That's, that's a good question. Uh, personal traits or? That's up to you. Okay, so what I just said I think is a good way to answer that question to, in, in, to start out. I think uh, anyone who's successful is vulnerable needs to be vulnerable, uh, needs to realize they don't have the whole picture. Uh, because, you know, you can go so far on your own, but without a good team of people around you, you're limited. Nobody has the whole picture. I mean, just in the human condition, you know, I think everybody has a gift, everybody has a superpower, and figuring out what that is and then monetizing it is the core, but then bringing people around you to, you know, instead of trying to improve the areas where you're weak, Bring people around you who already have strengths where you're weak, uh, whatever those areas may be. You know, a, a really good developer is never going to be a really good designer, and vice versa. Um, you know, a person who is, um, you know, great being a developer is probably not going to be a good salesperson. The, those, those skills rarely reside in the same person. Uh, so, but it, it comes down to that core aspect of, vulnerability and humility of realizing I don't have all the answers myself. So either you, know, you bring around a formal team as employees or contractors or just have strategic partnerships with other groups or other freelancers who have a piece of the pie that you don't have, right? And just building that network and growing that. I think that's a great place to start. Great. Uh, any other questions?